Welcome back to Drunkards and Dragons. I got a tasty little video for you today. So sit back, relax, get yourself a nice fermented beverage and enjoy. We are going to talk about none other than Index Card RPG. Out there, support the channel by getting yourself a copy of Index Card RPG on Drive-Thru RPG. The link is right here in the video. It's right right here somewhere. So click that, jump over, download the PDF for six bucks or six fifty, and you can take it to Staples or something like that, have it printed, the whole thing on nice cardstock for four bucks. So for ten bucks, you will get one hundred of these little index cards and you go home, cut them up just like you just saw me do. Had a great time doing it. It was actually over a little too quickly. How the heck am I supposed to use these drawings? <laughs> How can you take index card RPG stuff, all these silly little marker drawings, and get it straight to your game table and get a lot of use out of it? Now let's get this at an angle where maybe you can see a little better there, folks. Um, that's what the video is all about. How do you use what is commonly referred to as <clears throat> the index card method? The index card method is a very clear, very simple way to drive home all the concepts and the visuals that make up your night of game playing. Now, especially if you are new to Dungeons & Dragons, this is a great way to get into the hobby because it doesn't get you into so many details and expect you to know so much about the mechanical aspect of the game. So here, come in a little closer. Okay, so we all know that Dungeons & Dragons involves grids, right? Dungeons & Dragons involves grids. The grids are used to measure distances between characters and monsters, right? Here's a monster over here. Okay, this is conventional D&D. Now I have, there's a certain amount that I can move, my weapons have ranges, spells have ranges, there's different rules involving engaging and closing distance, and there's a double move, and there's a half move, and there's a lot to it because of a detailed representation of space. Now this is where the index card method is gonna kick ass, and there's two big ways that you can really use index card RPG, and this is the first one. So we'll talk about the second one, second, because it's the second one. But the first one is all about an economy of spatial detail. Now in Dungeons and Dragons, space is very carefully and literally measured, realistic, me realistically measured, and this is known as the sort of simulationist approach, right? You're simulating a battle. And so what you want to do is emphasize the believability of distances and reach and weapon properties and so on and so forth to get a believable simulation. But in recent times, modern RPGs have been focusing a great deal more on narrative than on simulation. The, the, the more modern RPGs want to cut to the cool key concepts rather than what tends to happen in simulation style games, which is you spend 60 to 70% of your time on the damn simulation and about 25 to 30% of your time on the cool stuff because you're trying to deal with all the measurement rules and distances and disengagements and the attacks of opportunity and touch attacks and like other ah, RPGs are here to stay. And I would actually predict they're going to have as big or bigger an effect on this hobby as Chainmail did on the hobby in the late 70s. Index card technique, its first biggest use, and the reason I want you guys to pick up a copy of this and get print them out and cut them and use them at your table, is because it will usher you into this more modern RPG mode, which is to forget about detailed space control and start thinking about concept control, okay? So, a classic example is one of the greatest, oldest staples in all of fantasy tabletop, which is a pack of goblins versus a group of heroes. Okay, so let's just have one hero for the sake of argument. It's good old Helm from the Rangers of Numidia. Can you see him there? He's tiny. Um, 
Now, you want to do a pack of goblins in your D&D game with your grid and everything, you're going to need a bunch of goblin minis or maybe paper minis or Pathfinder minis or something. You get them all, like, here, you know, you can, you can imagine. i got a group of these things, and then they're, move, they're at different distances, and they're moving in, and they engage at different times, and then you disengage, and then you, there's a bow shot, and then it's too far, and there's a penalty, and then it's, you're too close, and then there's this guy, and they're closing in. You get initiative. You get all this detail, right? Okay, well, let's put these away. In the index card technique, your pack of goblins is represented this simply. You got your pack of goblins card. It's on your table. Boom. Helm, the player, says, I'm going to engage the pack of goblins. Put the figure on the card. <laughs> that way your players have a super clear sense of who's doing what. And Already you can probably see how powerful this is going to get. So he's making some attack rolls. I'm making some attack rolls. Maybe there's a, one of the goblins has a poison dagger. Then he sweeps them and like takes three of them out. He rolls 2d12 to see how many are left. Great! I have a whole pack of goblins battle here, which is something that I want to happen. Here's what's awesome. Well, one of the many things about the index card method. Let's say I have a player who gets bored with the goblin fight. And he says, I want to look around. Well, you find the, uh, the gates to the goblin fort are nearby. And that player says, well, I want to go investigate the gates. There you go. Zymer is now over investigating the gates. Then Helm gets in a little bit of trouble. Maybe he's low on hit points. And Zymer says, well, okay, forget about the investigation. I'm going to go help him. I'm over there fighting the goblins now. Do you see how, like, space has suddenly become completely flexible? And so... Not only does it let you more simply move from concept to concept, your board can hold a lot more concepts than what you're probably used to. So let's say that these are the concepts of play. We have a pack of supplies, we have the druid ruins, we have the fortress gate, a rope bridge, and a mysterious door. We have Stills, who's a wily character, and he wants to sort of move ahead. He wants to or maybe he wants to sneak away from the party and he finds over here near the fort, he finds this pack of supplies. I just put his mini there. You're not suddenly bound by moving five clicks at a time. You can play a lot more world at any given moment. Helm says, you go ahead, I'll hold the goblins. Right? You know, Zymer can go around the gate or something. He winds up on the rickety bridge. He's making dex checks and then he's over here trying to decipher how to unlock the magical door. The whole time, this much world space is being covered. It's incredible. Dills and Helm are on the rickety rope bridge. It doesn't matter if they're 15 feet onto it or 25 feet onto it. They're on it. They're making dex checks. Maybe they're dodging arrows from, from the goblins giving chase. They're still making all the same cool dice rolls, but there are more concepts available. You can see how you can use these index cards to basically replace your tabletop board terrain, right? And you don't have to, you know, spend years crafting things out of styrofoam, which you definitely should do because it's awesome. But as I'd like to show here, index cards and crafting totally go hand in hand. It's fine. The other big one for replacing, replacing your game board with index cards is that in each volume of 100 cards, I am including this little bundle here. So you'll notice as you get your copy and print it out and do your cutting, that several of the cards actually have little drawn grids on them. And what I wanted to give you is, you know, everybody's different and you, you never know what's going to happen next. So let's say you have a door here and during a particular session, you actually do want a gridded out specific little corridor. There you go. you got a 10 foot wide corridor, classic element of all D&D. Maybe even in Dungeon World, you want to have a challenge where exactly where people place their mini is part of a puzzle or a trap, right? And, and you want to orchestrate that the way that it was in your imagination. Well, you can do that with the index cards as well. So here, just imagine I didn't already have this, this grid board here. This gives me a sweet, easy to read. I mean, this is so easy to see from anywhere on the table. It's a corridor leading into a room, right? And there's an entry door here. And let's say I only crafted one popsicle stick door. Okay, put the exit door there. <laughs> right? You guys came in right here. Blah, blah, blah. Talk, talk, talk. Roll, roll, roll. Okay, perception check succeeds. Hey, look, there's a door at the end of the far room there. By the way, if you step on this square, there's a 
15 Umbra Hulks fall out of a paper sack ab above you that was, you didn't notice. Anyway, in each pack of index card RPG, you're going to get a bunch of these little sort of grids. They're kind of like walls. There's like a marked trap floor, there are corridors, and then there are sort of pillar bases. So if you do have that moment where you get that grid itch, the index cards still give you all this capability. And being black and white, man, do they read great from a distance in low light because you know how cool low light can be and so on. So that's use number one for the index card method is to fundamentally replace your game board. Whoa. Okay, so now what's use number two? What's method number two? Well, here, why don't you come in a little closer and let's get into it. Big use for index card RPG has nothing to do with the table. It's about you, the dungeon master. And I know that uh, Pilly Pal over at Black Magic Craft, this is his first intent to use uh, the index card RPG, is as an idea, an adventure, and a story building tool, okay? So the hardest part of all tabletop, especially as a dungeon master, is sitting down there, looking at a blank page, and thinking, okay, I need to come up with a bunch of cool gameplay, right? Facing down that blank page and just saying, what am I gonna do? Well, it better be cool. Everybody's gonna give me the eye poke. So you need tools to help you with that moment, and this is the tool. So get your cards all printed out, when you get them all cut, you're gonna have a stack about, yay, I've got some little mini stacks here along the table, but you're gonna have a, a pretty fatty stack of all these things. And they range from monsters, there are like seafaring things, there are cave things, there are outdoor things, there are entire settings like castles and islands, there are mine carts and skeletons and wagons and all kinds of stuff, <laughs> just random. <laughs> so pick some of them you like. Don't even think about what you're doing. Just, just go on sheer appeal, okay? So I have a little collection of them right here that are just cards I picked because I thought, well, that looks cool. I don't even know what that is. That looks kind of cool. Just take them. Then get yourself a group. Let's say, let's get, let's get a group of, how about of two? Two groups, okay? So put all these others aside. So these are just two groups of cards that you thought kind of looked cool for absolutely no reason. Put no creative burden on yourself, right? Then, Take those cards, group them into two piles, and group the piles kind of like these kind of go together, right? It's like, well, I got this crazy Cthulhu statue and I got this tentacle. Those probably go together, right? Just use that kind of reasoning. Get yourself two piles and then just lay the pile out on your board. Like this. And now you have got probably a night of gameplay. The only step you need to do now is explain a little bit of what these concepts are gonna be. But this is exactly what the players are gonna see if you're using the index card table method. They're gonna see this old black magic cathedral where you know blasphemous rites are performed and chants emanate in the middle of the night. They go in and find this creepy feast where monkey meat and oh no that's a human leg and so on and so forth then beyond the main entry chamber there's this mysterious archway that's guarded by skeletons what i think there's a skeleton around here somewhere you know or maybe use minis for that maybe your minis for your characters there you go inside there's a big chamber on one side a weapons rack on the other an alchemist's table and at the far end the demon that the cult is worshiping with two rust monsters <laughs> for no damn reason. But either way, all you have to do is take these five cards, tuck them in your Dungeon Master's book, your, your journal, and later explain how the five of them stitch together. Is each one of these a room? And this is just the key item in each room? Or are they all in one huge room and this is the exit of the room at the end of the night? Or is fighting over this doorway what it's all about? Are they gonna be stuck right here on these stairs? And this demon is guarding this doorway. And you see how space just is completely loose? This demon doesn't fit in the doorway. He doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. He's in 3D, this is in 2D. But it doesn't matter. It gives your players a visual grounding where they can see the concepts at play and role play into them. Here's the second little pile that I just kind of randomly picked out that I thought, oh, those look kind of cool. 
you've got your tentacle, your haunting Cthulhu statue, and then this bizarre obelisk which seems to be activating with some kind of magical energy. Then you have a giant bookshelf, a ravenous otiug, a spike trap, followed by the craziest one of them all, which is this sort of precipice into the maelstrom. I don't know if that's focusing, probably not. Is it on the green button? I don't know. The precipice into the maelstrom goes last. Wow, if the players start here conceptually, they are battling a tentacle and somehow find this statue, which leads them through a series of, what is this, corridors? Is this a, an overland journey? I don't know, this is what I need to figure out in my journal. When they finally find the obelisk, activate it, discover the hidden library. But there's a guardian of the hidden library, which is this ravenous Otiug. They defeat the Otiug and discover an exit out into a strange supernatural environment. But first, whoa, trip, pit trap, stuff, make rolls. They make it past the pit trap to the precipice of the maelstrom. And there's this giant vertical storm rotating around the end of a broken stairway. And do they have what it takes to go in? And then, oh no, like Asmodeus pops out <laughs> with like 40 Mephits <laughs> and two Magmans. That is a night of gameplay. And, and this isn't even anything that is prepared in any way. The only thing that you did was thematically pick things that felt cool. Also, remember, if you're into like vertical stuff, you can get vertical with this too. You just take your normal Pathfinder base, just like that, stick your card right in it. Here, let's get level. Let's get level. Just like that, there's your Umber Hulk. So you can totally use Pathfinder bases with index card RPG and get vertical monsters if that's what you're into. Or maybe you want your doors to be vertical. You just put them right in there like so. And there I got my vertical tentacle. So you can have your board be as 3D as you want or be completely flat, which gives people a little more visibility and lets you march minis around on them. Or you can do the vertical technique. Man, it's just so fun. So anyway, that's my big plug. That's my video. I'm a huge believer in the index card method. I started it last year with, uh, with a Dungeon World sort of mini campaign that I did. Um, also, you guys probably noticed I used the index card method on uh, Night of the Crack, which was one of the best adventures I ran all year. And I'm just a huge believer in it. And I'm going to bring it in right into the center of my game in 2017. And I hope you do the same with me because I want to take Runehammer Games to the stratosphere. The more support I get, the more products I can create, the more I can focus on it. So it's great to have you guys around. Strength, honor, index cards? That isn't really a, much of a battle cry, is it? Strength, honor, and index cards. <laughs> That's like strength, honor, and post-its. No, it's terrible. Let's stick to the basics, guys. Strength, honor, and beer. I'll see you at the tabletop. Until next time, Anchor Infernale.